So if you don't know who we are, we're the Data Science Alliance and we're an organization that is committed to advancing the field of data science and San Diego as a leader in that field. And so we do that by kind of focusing on building up our existing ecosystem. We've prioritized three areas, problem solving, business investment and talent development. Um, and we pick these because these are the three things that we see as, um, as high priority areas for San Diego's ecosystem to start to evolve. Problem solving, because that is what data science is. So let's start solving some problems and showcasing the talent and the power of data scientists here in San Diego. Business investment, because we're, um, the field will grow as more and more businesses from across industries adopt data science as sort of a norm. And then talent development, because we will get nowhere if we don't have the talent um, that is not only educated, but trained um, to, to engage quickly and ready to go um, and connect them to industry as needed. So those are our three priorities. And you can learn a little bit more about who we are, uh, the, the board and the team by going on the website. Uh, we encourage you to follow us on social media. We have the channels listed there. You can also find them on our website. Uh, but I really wanna take a second and just encourage you to take a look at our uh, opp opportunities to become a member because we are a member-based organization um, and also volunteer. We have a growing community of volunteers. We couldn't do what we do every day without them and we're really appreciative of them. Um, and so please consider either volunteering and or becoming a member. Today's data skills, we're gonna talk to a friend of mine, Colin, um, who I just adore. And uh, I think he's gonna be great. He's gonna teach us about audio and how audio is data. And I asked him not to tell me anymore because I, I think I know what that means and I think I know what he's gonna do, but I really don't. And I'm kind of excited to learn with you all um, and see where he takes us. I think it's gonna be kind of a fun adventure. So, um, so Colin has this sort of curious mind. I think we, I think it's, a requirement for data scientists, but he has he's this curiosity and he takes, he sort of takes action, right? So he'll start to just tinker and work on things because he's just curious about it. Um, I think that makes him an excellent data scientist um, and I'm excited to have him here and I'm really curious about how we're going to learn how audio is data. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know him, I'll read you his, um, <clears throat> his bio, which is it's going to tell you a little bit more about his personality, the way this is written, because I love it. So Colin Jemmett is a senior data scientist at Seismic, where he currently builds recommender systems. At Seismic's for, as Seismic's first data scientist, he has achieved many accomplishments, from search learning to rank to deep learning and from interactive visualizations to NLP. Colin ships code to production and does math on paper. Colin is also a lecturer at UCSD's Hala Jailu Data Science Institute. There he designed a class that is super fun, DSC 96, Perspectives in Data Science, where he describes, which he describes as intro level big picture plus stuff that fell between the cracks in other classes. He has also taught a large intro lecture class, DSC 10, Principles of Data Science, designed and taught a seminar on technical presentations and interview skills, DSC 90, and in fall 2020, was running the Senior Capstone Project track on recommender systems. On official evaluations, 96% of students said they would recommend the instructor in his classes. Please join me in welcoming the fantastic Colin Chemet. Wow. Well, wow, that's a lot to live up to. <laughs> Thank you for the kind intro. Um, so so uh, when I was invited to give this thing, I thought, hey, I don't really know what I want to talk about. And I kind of I went back and forth a bunch. Um, one of the odd things with this is you don't quite know who's going to who's going to be here. Right. Um, and so uh, after thinking about it a bunch, I said, hey, I want to talk about audio and I'll tell you a little bit about why. Um, so, so the reason for me, um, is my path to data science, right? So, uh, 
this leaves out a little bit. Uh, I thought I, I wanted to do stuff with computers when I was coming out of high school and then uh, um, did not take well to that. So slid over into engineering stuff, um, got my, my bachelor's in engineering and, and a master's and then ended up getting a PhD in acoustics. So what I did back then was really sonar signal processing. And a lot of the math that I did in my dissertation um, is stuff that was lifted from uh, a book called Probabilistic Robotics that talked about um, the math that really was behind some of the early self-driving cars, the DARPA Grand Challenge that, that actually you know, went a little ways. And I adapted that to a, a different problem, a sonar problem. So I worked at the Naval Research Lab, did those kind of things for a while. And honestly, I really thought I was setting myself up for a career uh, doing acoustical science, right? To, to, to study sonar, maybe some other uh, acoustics problems, but, but sort of doing applied physics. And then um, I think it was 2013, uh, the federal government decided to do this thing, uh, the sequester, which some of you may remember, and they just decided to shrink budgets. And so the Navy looked at it and said, well, we got to pull a bunch of money out of our budget. Um, basic research, let's cancel all that. Um, I just started being a, a PI, writing my own grants, and I had this DARPA grant where I was going to get to go up to the uh, near the North Pole, drill through the polar ice cap and put some uh, sensors down and record some underwater sound up there um, and, and do some, some work with that. Um, and then it... It all disappeared and I was unemployed. So I read this uh, this thing that said, hey, uh, data scientist is this new idea um, and the math looked familiar. So I took a couple of months and taught myself how to code and uh, made up a resume where it looked like I was a data scientist and talked my way into a startup. Um, the reason I tell the story is two things. One, it explains why I want to talk about audio a little bit and, and why audio is data, right? Because I used to live in that world a lot. Um, the other one is uh, a lot of data scientists today wandered in, right? So we have, we have previous careers, um, especially the senior folks. We're starting to see more and more junior folks that, that were trained in data science, but, um, but I certainly wasn't. Um, so I, I, like I said, I talked my way into a startup. Uh, we were really good at building stuff and really bad at selling stuff. And so we ran out of money um, and we were acquired by Seismic, where I am today. Um, uh, that's been a great ride. I've been there about four years and uh, um, like I was mentioned in the intro, do recommender systems. Um, so since this talk is an indulgence, I'm going to tell you the coolest thing I learned when I was in graduate school studying sonar. This is a map of, of the whole world, right? Uh, Walter Monk, who uh, was at UCSD, and if you have not read this obituary notice, I highly recommend it. Um, he was a wild person. Uh, did all sorts of things about tidal energy, ocean acoustics, rotation of the earth, uh, hung out with the Dalai Lama and the Pope, uh, refused to take the loyalty pledge that uh, UCSD uh, required at the time um, with all the anti-communist stuff in the 50s, um, and even developed the architecture style uh, at Scripps Oceanographic, right? But one of the things he did is this, which is called uh, uh, HIFAS, the... Um, herd island feasibility test. And the idea is there is this island that no joke is called herd island. And they basically lowered a, an underwater loudspeaker um, off a boat near that island and they played a tone and they played the tone so loud and for so long it was a coded pulse, right? Um, that they picked it up at all of these locations marked in red. So uh, it's really neat when you're reading the paper they published about it, uh, they talk about megameter range uh, audio detection, acoustic detection. Um, so this isn't exactly data science, uh, but it's, um, I don't know. I figure if I got one thing that was cool that I learned in grad school, uh, I got to share it with people. Um, in case it's not clear, these are actually straight lines, right? Um, but when you do, uh, uh, project a globe onto a flat surface, uh, they, they make weird curves. And so these are great circle lines. 
And it's just stunning that from one island, there's a straight shot to the east and west coast of the U.S., right? I, I would not have guessed that. Um, so. Cool. All right. Um, let's get into sound. So sound is, is really touch at a distance. Uh, it's a vibration. It travels through the air uh, as a longitudinal pressure wave. Um, longitudinal meaning like a, a compression and refraction, not a back and forth uh, wave. And in general, how hard you shake something is proportional to how loud it is and how fast you shake it is related to the frequency or the tone. Um, just to get some of the basic physics out of the way, uh, uh, there's transducers and, and what a transducer does, either a speaker or a microphone or whatever, fundamentally is just taking uh, the, the mechanical energy of, of air or whatever vibrating and turns it into electrical energy or vice versa. So a speaker, you put electricity in, sound comes out. Um, uh, what's really interesting about this is as these devices have gotten cheaper and better, uh, they're showing up everywhere. So electric microphones uh, are, are in every device, right? Everything is listening to you now. And in fact, your phone probably has multiple microphones on it. Um, and that's for things like wind noise reduction and background noise reduction. So uh, if you've got the new not even the new iPhone, a little while older iPhone. It's actually got five microphones hidden all over that thing. Um, okay, so once we're in an electrical signal, we're in a more uh, familiar place for doing data science, but this is still an analog electrical signal. And I wanna mention the existence of sampling because it's something that data scientists, I think are uh, often, um, undertrained in compared to the electrical engineers and stuff I used to hang out with. So when you're recording a sound, to be able to do things digitally, we want to uh, turn it into a list of numbers, right? Everything on the computer is just a list of numbers. So the first thing we do is we sample in time, right? So uh, typically even increments uh, for audio, uh, something like 40,000 times a second, uh, 44,000 is a really common number. And, and you're going through and, and just grabbing this list of numbers. The next thing you might wanna do for uh, making the files a little bit smaller um, is also to discretize them. So you sample um, not only in time, uh, but also uh, in levels. So you have maybe um, two to the 16 discrete levels. So now you can write down an audio waveform as just a list of integers uh, and, and you can start doing stuff with that, right? Um, you know, I'm just gonna mention the existence of this, but there are some really neat properties uh, from, from um, some processing and math. Uh, and one of them is the sampling idea that says, if you're just doing this time-based sampling, and you do it fast enough for a given signal, you can exactly get the signal back. Um, and, and it's surprisingly uh, slow. Um, how it's twice the, the bandwidth of the thing you're looking at. So twice as off, uh, frequent as the, typically the highest frequency. So. Okay, other stuff that came out of uh, my acoustics background that I, I think uh, I wanna uh, have data scientists think a little bit more about, um, one of them is noise. So noise is often hard to tease apart. Um, I used to work in passive sonar and in passive sonar, it's not the, the ping and listen to echoes back, you're just listening. And so in a sense, everything is noise, right? Boats, whales, whatever. And I, I had a, a graduate student that I shared an office with and she was listening for whales in these passive recordings. And so all the boats were noise and I was trying to listen to the boats. And so all the whales were noise, right? So one of the things I want to relate uh, to everybody is that fundamentally there isn't some like acoustic or aesthetic thing that makes something noise and something else signal. It really is about um, what it is you're looking for and what it, you're not looking for, right? So, so it's a categorization problem, not like some fundamental thing in the world. Um, if you like that idea, I strongly recommend the book, The Unwanted Sound of Everything We Want. Um, it's a, a book about noise and it's a super interesting thing. Um, 
it's a very personal story, um, but it's got a lot of science in it, um, and I've never read anything like it. It's it's really cool. Um, but this idea about noise um, being the part of the signal you don't want, I think is true everywhere. Um, audio has this cool property where uh, uh, everything's linear, and so things just superimpose, they just add, um, which is really handy. Uh, all right, the, the last one I'll mention uh, for uh, cool things that, that I wish data scientists knew more about is that we typically plot time series in the time domain. So we have this idea that there's like uh, some, some measurement, either voltage or pressure or something and a, a time and, and we're making some plot. Um, but it's also possible to represent things in a frequency domain, right? So there's a thing called a Fourier transform, which lets you go back and forth between time and frequency. And what's neat about that is if you're playing maybe two tones and you have some noise also and you record them, it can be really hard to see what's going on when you look at a time series. But when you decompose it into the frequency domain, um, you can see a lot more about what's going on. This is true in business data too. So you might have uh, your sales volume spikes quarterly or you see a really strong weekly tempo in, in the data, right? Uh, people are very active on weekends or not active on weekends. And doing um, being able to do time frequency transforms uh, lets you have a whole other way to visualize data that's often not available if you, if you don't know that. So um, a little bit about audio, uh, so, so the sound that we hear, um, we measure it in hertz, uh, which is a unit is one over second, and it's how many times things shake back and forth every second, right? Um, we can hear things that shake back and forth anywhere from 20 times a second to, to 20,000 times a second, roughly, um, unless you're getting towards my age, and then that number starts, starts cranking down as you get older, the, the top end, you start losing the high frequencies. Um, frequency and pitch actually have a complicated relationship. So, so the pitch that you perceive and the frequency that's there are not identical, but they're they're closely correlated. Um, and in general, tones have these like distinct frequencies, and and broadband noise has has like really wide stuff. So, so what we're going to look at here is a, a time frequency plot. So, so here we've decomposed in, in both ways, and so uh, frequency is going to be the vertical axis, and time is going to be the, the horizontal. Um, it, it can be pretty hard to tell what's going on in these plots, but what I'm showing here is uh, something that's really uh, common in computer science uh, uh, that we don't talk a ton about in data science also, and that's lossy compression. So you might be familiar with lossless compression. Lossless compression is this idea that you can like zip a file or whatever. And, and because there's a lot of repetition in the data, you can make instructions for remaking the file that are smaller than the original file, right? But there's also this idea of uh, lossy compression. So you've probably seen memes that were resaved too many times and the picture starts looking kind of crunchy and things like that. Um, that's because every time you save that image as a new format, um, it sort of recompresses it and makes it a little smaller. With audio, there's actually a bunch of standards. So this matters when you start getting into loading things up and actually uh, doing data science on, on sound. Um, wave files are really common. That's the basically just the list of numbers. Uh, typically, it will be two lists of numbers because we do stereo sound a lot. So uh, you'll have the left and right channel. Um, there's other options, though. Uh, MP3s you've probably heard of, AACs on Apple products, uh, all sorts of um, things. And what's really interesting about when you start doing lossy compression is two things. One is uh, what you're fundamentally trying to do is throw out the information that doesn't matter. So you'll notice in this time frequency plot, the left one is uh, the original, the right one is uh, the compressed one. And a lot of the extreme high frequencies are just chopped off. They just threw away that data. And it turns out most people can't hear the difference. Um, and so, so if you play both songs back to back, you won't maybe have a strong preference. Some people do, some people are very sensitive to that. Um, I think that's largely a thing that you can train yourself to be sensitive to or not. And I would encourage you to think carefully about it because once you hear audio quality, uh, a lot of things get sort of 
painful to listen to. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> maybe don't do that. Um, so so I, I really like this idea in lossy data compression that we're trying to hide the missing data in places where we're not sensitive to it. Um, a, a specific example that's really neat is uh, when you have a loud clapping or snapping sound, uh, there's actually this delay where your ear sort of recovers from that, that loud impulse. And it's, it's only a couple of milliseconds long, but you can hide some noise in there and, and most people can't tell it's going on. Um, so with early MP3s, one of the best things you could do is listen to like wood blocks clicking or clapping and you could hear a little bit of crunchiness afterwards. Um, the other cool thing is the computer science side of it, right? So lossy compression uh, has a bunch of properties. One of them might be, is this thing streamable? Do you need the whole file before you start reassembling it or can you reassemble it as it comes in, right? Um, another one is the asymmetry of encode and decode. So typically you'll encode these files once and then decode them millions of times if you're a streaming service or whatever. And when you encode, you have the cloud, right? You can do whatever. But when you're decoding, you're on a mobile device that's on battery. And so putting more effort into making it easy to decode is actually super important. Um, and one last thing that you may run into is some of these standards are proprietary. And so if you're trying to load certain files in code, there are not open source solutions that read all of them. Uh, so your best bet is to find a, a free audio converter, convert it back to a WAV file and, and deal with it there. So MP3s and stuff, you're fine. But if you start getting into the Apple formats, uh, it's dicey. Okay. Uh, digital signal processing is, is this idea of uh, often time series processing. And in audio, uh, both sonar and, and sort of um, like musical acoustics and stuff that you're, you might've been thinking of, um, there's a bunch of uh, stuff you can do. So usually it's linear transforms. So linear transforms would include filtering, which is uh, maybe like getting rid of all the high frequencies or whatever, um, or adding reverberation. So reverberation is a bunch of delayed copies at lower magnitude. Um, and, and that gives you that uh, echoey sound that you hear. Um, most albums have uh, digital reverb, um, but obviously if you go in a echoey space, a bathroom or a church or a, a gym, you can hear that, that echoing. So that's a, an area where there's a ton of work and there's a lot of really nice proofs and there's a lot of um, robustness in, in digital signal processing. And I just don't see data science folks picking it up as much as they should. And I think it's a missed opportunity. I think there's a bunch of stuff there that I use and, and I look at it and say, hey, I wish other people, um, I think other people would benefit from that. There's also a bunch of nonlinear things. So amplitude compression is a big one, which uh, is, is sort of a way of making everything the same loudness. So like on television advertisements or some bands, it sounds like everything's just just loud all the time. Um, that's a nonlinear processing technique. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, clever audio stuff that's happened. So it's, it's a, a really interesting field because it's a bunch of people experimenting. It's a bunch of artists. It's people making guitar reverb pedals and all this stuff. And um, that signal processing can be really fun to try to understand. That's a lot of background. Are there any questions you need to throw them in the chat or uh, or just speak up um, about all that stuff before we hop into applications? I'm curious when you say um, you find DSP useful for data scientists, I agree totally and I'm probably biased because I come from a weirdly similar background of electrical engineer gone into acoustics and then into machine learning. Um, so do you, consider it useful because the theoretical background is just very easily applicable to other parts of machine learning, which is, has been my experience, or do you think it's actually useful in and of itself as an application? Yeah, probably more the first one, right? So, so knowing about linearity and knowing about noise and, and sort of systems thinking and, and all that stuff, super helpful. Um, there are places I've used directly used stuff though. Uh, monitoring and alerting tools. Um, I think a lot of people do a bad job at that because they just don't understand what like 
rates and latching and whatever. And then <laughs> this is super funny, but one of the things that happened to me was uh, because I did audio stuff, I ended up doing live sound for a radio station for a while. And the debugging that I learned from concerts and things has applied to code better than anything that people taught me in code. Um, uh, it, it's surprising how useful that stuff ended up being. Um, but yeah, I think I think you captured that well. I agree. All right. So so the big uh, application for uh, audio signal processing in in data science is uh, speech recognition. And uh, I'm going to go in a little bit of detail here, uh, with the caveat that that speech recognition is not my main area, um, but. Uh, one thing that I really like reminding folks who are new to the field is that this is a field that has, it seems like it works really well now, um, but it was a very long path to get here and it was very resistant. Um, so there's a technique in the 60s called dynamic time warping. Um, there's a, a depiction of sort of how it works, uh, but it actually, they were having a small vocabulary, isolated word recognition it was doing pretty well. So, um, you know, and that's that's quite a while ago, especially considering computing power. Um, and by the 70s, we were actually getting okay results uh, with continuous speech. Um, the problem was the the processing time was was hilarious, right? So, so this was done with Markov chains, which is this idea that um, each word has a certain probability transition to every other word, um, which captures a little bit of how speech is put together. Um, we were never going to get the accuracy we needed that way, um, but it was interesting that we keep trying new techniques. Uh, we started doing um, sort of a similar idea uh, with with n-grams, which is uh, pairs or triads or more words, and faster computers and and larger vocabularies, and we kept cranking at it. And then by the '90s, we actually had okay results with special chips and limited vocabularies, and uh, you saw that some like. If you would um, get stuck in a phone tree, they started getting yes and no, and like the ability to read numbers back instead of typing them in, stuff like that, right? So, so there were very limited vocabularies that did okay. Um, that kept getting better and better, um, but the poor accuracy was actually a huge problem. And one of the main drivers for that was how terrible audio quality was. Um, obviously, deep learning is what made the the big break in this, um, and uh, and now, you know, speech to text is everywhere, but it's actually pretty bad. Um, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, it stinks in a lot of places though. So jargon uh, is really tough. Uh, if you're using a lot of odd words or proper nouns, uh, things fall apart really fast. Um, and I think that's true for people who who just speak English also, right? If you don't have domain specific knowledge and you end up at some meeting, it can be really hard to tell if somebody's saying like VCR, like a, a video cassette recorder or PCR, like the, the biology term um, without sort of knowing what meeting you're in, right? Um, accents, uh, my uh, uncle uh, has a very strong Texas accent and none of the assistants can understand a word he's saying. Um, I also struggle. Um, uh, a lot of words are, are confused, there's context. Um, I, I personally believe noise is a huge issue. And one of the reasons I think that's true is I have trouble understanding people on the telephone, right? Um, telephones sound bad. Uh, you might see a little um, thing sticking into the, the screen here and it's, it's because I have a good microphone because I really, it helps me understand people when, when the audio quality is high. Um, and then, and then sort of the fundamental thing that I think is true, which uh, is going to be the, the, the next big challenge for this, is that transcription is not actually the challenge. Understanding intent is the challenge. And we're going to need context and things to, to get there. But if you read a transcript of a casual conversation, it's actually very hard to follow, right? Um, you, should, you should look one up, like look up a court transcript or something. Um, they're very confusing. And, and there's just a lot of stuff in there uh, that can be really hard. So I like to play with the vocal assistants. And uh, at one point I, I shouted at, um, oh, maybe the, the Google one or something. And I said, 
yo yo donuts how do i make them and it gave me a recipe for a thing called yo yo donuts right given the transcript that is the best you could possibly hope for but like obviously not what i wanted all right there's a bunch on speech there's also a ton of other cool applications for uh audio data science um obviously my background was sonar uh what we're looking at here is uh a sonar from a, a ship and and you can see um really how bad the presentation is in a lot of ways uh sonar is uh, this is active sonar so uh, a ship will make a ping and it will wait uh, sound travels uh, uh about a kilometer every three seconds and so the, the echoes come in over time sound travels exceptionally well underwater so you can get detections at, at pretty large distances but you also get reflections off rocks and boats and shorelines and and some things are reflective and some aren't and it, it's really it can be overwhelming so uh here you can see a pier maybe some shoreline what they call bottom features which is rocks or sunken ships or who knows what um and then uh you also see there's nothing past a certain range and that's where the the sound just isn't isn't coming back it's too far it's too noisy all that stuff um Sonar is in a cool place, and I think it would benefit a lot from data scientists. Uh, we spent, the US spent enormous amounts on sonar during the Cold War. Um, when I was at the Naval Research Lab, everybody, and this was eight years ago, uh, 10 years ago, everybody was retirement age. Um, they, there's very few young folks in there. And uh, it's, it's sort of amazing watching that area reboot as, uh, the average age drops by by 30 years. Um, and I think we're going to see right some of the big cloud contracts and stuff. We're going to see real revolutions in uh, military sonar, but I think also civilian and, and all that stuff. Um, uh, and yeah. Uh, another one. Um, so sound gets used for all sorts of stuff. Uh, medical ultrasound is a big one. Uh, medical ultrasound comes in, in two flavors. Uh, Sometimes it's used to, uh, to actually as a treatment. So you can like break up kidney stones with really loud sounds. Um, but sometimes you actually do imaging, ultrasound imaging. And uh, many of you probably think this is what an ultrasound looks like, right? Because this is the, the one I was used to. Um, but some of the new signal processing and data science stuff, this is what ultrasounds look like now, right? And they're actually movies. They you can you can watch uh, the the fetus move around and stuff. Um, so there's some really interesting work, um, and a, some of it is image processing, but a lot of it is acoustic processing. Right? You're actually imaging through organs and stuff, and you got to figure out like what the sound path looks like. And so it's a lot of physics-based signal processing, but it's also a lot of um, what I think of more as traditional data science. And then uh, to get more explicit sort of data science examples, uh, here's one um, that uh, it has been really big on and off, um, which is condition-based maintenance. So the idea here is um, there are, like, machines fail, right? So, so imagine a, a big motor or uh, the one that um, at a, professor that was working on doing some research in graduate school was uh, actually the the box in the top of a helicopter that uh, is the gearbox that keeps the the spinny bits that keeps everybody alive and those go bad and sometimes before they go bad the pilots will say hey it's starting to make that noise like it's going bad and so the idea was if you could listen to what's going on maybe you could do better um, so this was a slide from some of their uh, stuff. And, and what they actually do is they do oil sampling. That was state of the art before they did condition-based uh, maintenance. And the, the oil sampling, they pull uh, individual like, like little slugs of oil and they let it settle and they see if there's metal shavings in the bottom. And if there's metal shavings in the bottom, then things are getting really bad in that gearbox, right? Um, but that may not buy you enough time. And so the idea is you may be able to push it a little earlier by attaching some sensors and listening, right? 
The reason I bring up this example is I think there's a maybe a lot of problems where we could use audio as data in ways that are unexpected, right? Um, where we can start debugging this stuff and, and start trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I like this one. Uh, used to really love the Discover Weekly. Oh, did I lose you? I used to really love the Discover Weekly stuff. Um, lately, it seems like it's mine stuck in a little bit of a rut. But um, I think a lot of people, when they hear music recommendations, uh, think standard recommendation system, right? It's um, it's going to be collaborative filtering or one of the other common data science uh, techniques. Um, but Spotify has, has said publicly that uh, actually processing the audio in there is important to them. Um, and one cool thing is you can actually go in and request features for any audio track. So they have things like major or minor key, does it have lyrics, all the rest. Uh, there's a developer API and, and you can go grab all that data uh, if you have a Spotify premium account, um, uh, which is, is kind of fun. There's also a always a, a dump of it uh, for the top, I don't know, 10,000 songs every year on, on Kaggle or whatever. Um, but they use a lot of that data to uh, help influence the, the recommendation systems. They also use it in what I thought was a more unexpected way, which is hit song detection. So this isn't hit song detection once an album's out, it's hit song detection at like the record label stage. So if somebody's recording, they can say, hey, this sounds okay, but if we ran it through this other recording studio, it would give us a sound that we predict is slightly better. Or like feed a certain album through uh, uh, some algorithms and say, hey, we think that this is the, the hit track from this. Um, in a lot of cases, there's still people involved, uh, but this, the volume of new music that's produced means uh, a lot of record labels are actually just grabbing tons of demos and running them through this stuff and seeing what, what pops up is interesting. Um, uh, machine learning uh, is used in source separation. So karaoke, uh, one of the things that's there is uh, often you wanna rip the vocals out. If you have an original multi-track recording, that's easy. So multi-track recordings, they record the, the drums and the guitar and the vocals separate. And so you can just not put in the vocals and you're good to go. Um, but a lot of karaoke systems now, I think basically all, uh, they run through a vocal remover thing. But, but vocal removing is not just like a set of frequencies or something, right? The frequencies all overlap, the times overlap. There isn't a clean way to just like subtract out vocals. And so uh, people have done really neat work on this. Uh, and what's cool is you could actually turn that into a supervised problem uh, when you have the original multi-track recordings, right? Because you could make sort of the ideal version of it um, with the, the vocals missing. You could make the version with the vocal in, the original one, and then like run those against each other um, for a bunch of examples and then try it out on, on some new data. The lyrics are also often uh, uh, transcribed that way, right? There's still people involved, but because of copyright issues, uh, you actually want to have slightly different lyrics than other sites. Um, lyrics are typically not, um, uh, like if you go and grab all of them from someone else, there's actually a lawsuit. I don't know if it got settled, but, but there's been lawsuits about uh, owning copyright on various lyrics. Um, but I know the, the one of the big karaoke companies, I've got a friend there who uh, they use transcription software to try to pull the lyrics. Um, and the last example um, that I wanna spend a little bit of time on is uh, local San Diego, right? Data Science Alliance and, and many of us are here. Um, I don't know if everybody knows about these things, but if you live in one of the more uh, urban or sort of uptown neighborhoods, there's likely to be one in, in your area. And it's this thing called a, a shot spotter and it's an acoustic sensor that uh, listens for gunfire um, and it does some localization work, which is some basic um, beamforming, sort of like how you can tell which direction sounds are coming from. And uh, 
we deployed these uh, a couple of years ago and they have not been performing especially well. And I think what's really interesting about them is that, that it actually, it's like a popular news article that's talking about false alarm rates and misdetections and things that, that are really like ideas that we use a lot in, in data science. Um, and it also gets at a lot of the ethical stuff. So, so the company says it has a false positive rate, meaning uh, they say there's a, a shot a gunshot and there is not actually one of half a percent right um in practice in san diego uh 72 out of uh almost 600 were were unfounded um that includes ones where they couldn't find evidence of a gunshot they typically interview neighbors and stuff and um, but a lot of cases it's jackhammers nail guns people hammering all this stuff and what's, what's worse is that it's neighborhood specific. And it turns out when you dig into it, the spot shotter company did its testing in a very suburban neighborhood. Um, they didn't have cars backfiring. They didn't have people doing fireworks in the street. Uh, they didn't have people doing construction projects in their driveway because they had a garage, right? So they're, they're like not, not in the proper area. So really what this thing ended up doing is sending the police thinking there's, you know, somebody shooting a gun in a neighborhood, screeching up at high speed um, into neighborhoods that uh, uh, typically are, are, you know, more minority and more uh, poor. Um, and uh, it happens at, at really high rates. Um, and we've all seen that can be a big problem. And I, I like this example a lot because it thinks about um, I mean, obviously it's, it's an audio one, but, but it also has a lot to do with uh, sort of how you select data, how you do testing, um, all that stuff that, that we should be talking a lot about. Um, cool. So that's all I had for today. Uh, I wanted to leave some time for questions in case people had, uh, had that. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Colin. That was super interesting. Anyone have any questions? I actually, while we're waiting for questions, I, um, I'm, and if you don't know, I'm pregnant, and so I've been having a lot more ultrasounds in my life these days. And I, I didn't know, I had no idea, but my ultrasound tech recently, she did tell me it was all uh, audio related. It was, and I was, it was fascinating, and they turn. The old, they go from old school, she switches the wand, and then all of a sudden I'm like, there's a kid in, there's a kid in here, 3D, it's pretty fascinating. So yeah, I had no idea about that until recently. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and, and like a lot of things, the difference was computing power, right? Being able to do that in real time required, you know, some, some pretty serious force. Um, and so we're, we're just getting to the place where we can deal with that volume. Um, the other one was like direct visualization of audio uh, with with some some little bit of signal processing. So, wow. so then that then that's my question would be, as as the computing power continues to increase and, and um, uh, we, we have more of it over time, where does this go? Like, um, where does audio and data? Where do we go from here? Oh, that's good. So, so I said in the beginning that this talk was a little bit indulgent. And one of the things is I've never done, not, not much data science on audio, right? Uh, I did audio for a long time and then I did data science for a long time. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think one of the big questions for me is, uh, how much people are going to let themselves be recorded. Um, I've been shocked at how many people are letting microphones in their house. Uh, my mom has one in her bedroom now, I'm like it's blowing my mind. Um, but, but a lot of that audio I think, uh, could end up being useful. And then I think the real wild card is like, it's not a signal we, we go to, right. We tend to do RF like, uh, electric mechanic or, you know, electric, uh, spectrum, um, or, uh, 
maybe uh, sometimes light, right? But but audio is like always, um, it's hard, it's, it's messier, it's not as good as a lot of other ones. So the one I want as a, somebody who worries about uh, audio quality and stuff is uh, better and better uh, noise cancellation. But we'll see what happens. Okay. The, oh, go ahead. Sorry. You mentioned the Nyquist Shannon uh, sampling theorem, and it's funny because I've known about it for two decades now, but never really connected it to the data science world. Um, and it triggered a train of thought, which I'd love to have your input on, which is, and then the Nyquist Shannon theorem says, if your signal doesn't contain a frequency above X, then you don't need to sample more than this number of times. Whereas in the machine learning world, it's become almost a truism of source that more data is better. And I'm wondering if something similar to the Shannon Nyquist theorem might come up with a counterintuitive you don't need more than X samples to train a neural network or, or, or a random forest or something like that. I like that. I like that. So, so that almost slides over into like the information theory and stuff. Uh, the one place I've seen it is um, when people were interpreting some of the GDPR stuff uh, and deciding how much to aggregate data, right? Um, so, so if you make like if you if you average every ten people or, or whatever, um, or same idea with geospatial, right? So these aren't time series representations, but they're they're you're lumping stuff together, right? Um, you know, geospatial is a neat one. If if you're trying to figure out a feature that's the size of a road, right? You only need to sample twice a road uh, for for the, the the broadest stuff, right? You, you don't actually need to go smaller, um, and that might be. Anonymity preserving a little. I like it though. Uh, I'm gonna have to think on that one. Yeah. Oh. Oh, and, and this is super pedantic, but uh, it's the bandwidth. And there's a really neat trick you can do um, occasionally. Uh, Oh, I lost everybody. Um, uh, where you, if you have a band limited signal but it's shifted up, you can actually sample uh, and, and like baseband it at the same time. Um, it's super slick, uh, but but it doesn't. It, it never matters. I just, it's fun. Well, Colin, thank you so much for this um, sh sharing your insights with us here at Data Skills. I really appreciate your time, and um, I just always love connecting with you. It's always kind of fascinating. Yeah, uh, thanks for the invitation. This was super yeah. fun. And thank you all for participating and joining us. Uh, just as a reminder, we have about two events every month. You can you can check them out on our website. We have an events page now, so you can see the upcoming events. Um, usually, it's a data skills, and then, and then also a data stories. Uh, and we welcome you to come join us for those each, each, each month. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, Colin. All right. Thanks.